Uh, so welcome everybody to the last part of the workshop. Uh, the idea in this section is to start a discussion about policy questions and the research agenda for the trade and spatial frictions theme in STEC. I will give a short introduction first on how uh, COSTAS and I see research in this area, and then our panelists will give us uh, their own views. Uh, so, you know, a key question in this theme is uh, how globalization shapes uh, the structural transformation process in developing countries. Um, from you know, economic history, we know that in the first industrialized countries, high agricultural productivity favored this process by increasing income and demand for manufacturers. And in turn, during the second wave of industrialization, uh, which took place in East Asian countries, exports of simple manufacturing goods generated savings to finance the human and physical capital investments needed to generate a comparative advantage in higher value added industries. Uh, however, uh, industrialization has not yet uh, taken off in several low income countries, you know, notably in Latin America, Africa, and South Asia. The economics or international economics literature um, has a particular view on this problem and suggests two main potential explanations. A uh, first one is that the classic demand and savings channels that were you know, probably operative in these uh, previous episodes might not operate in resource-rich economies where industrial goods can be imported and savings can be exported. Uh, a second you know, set of issues uh, has to do with how low internal market integration might constrain the process of labor and capital relocation towards the most productive regions, sectors, or firms. Um, so there is this uh, very rich uh, theoretical literature pointing to, to these potential explanations. Uh, however, at this point, we have very scarce empirical evidence. Um, we think we need more research uh, to assess the quantitative relevance of these and other uh, potential explanations. Uh, we are very happy to have this uh, fantastic group of panelists to share their views on how we should uh, shape this research agenda. Um, so, Nina, do you want to start? Yeah, so uh, just kind of broad question you're asking how to shape the research agenda? Yes. Yes. Yeah. yes. So, uh, so, you know, one of the questions, uh, th first of all, th thank you very much for uh, having me in this uh, panel. Uh, I think it's actually great that STEG uh, has put together these uh, uh, five working groups. Uh, I think they all kind of relate to each other. And I think the only way we can kind of make progress on some of these issues if uh, in addition to groups talking within each other, they also talk across each other. I think a lot of the uh, talk, I was in, at the panel uh, yesterday in the agricultural gap uh, group. Uh, and I think a lot of the themes are actually similar to today. So, uh, you know, one thought I, uh, one thing that I have been thinking a lot about is this question of how do you think globalization and market integration shapes the structural transformation? And I think, uh, I think there's a lot of open questions in this literature. Um, uh, I'm going to draw mainly on studies that rely on uh, uh, studying the ex uh, effects of kind of large scale trade episodes that were implemented in developing countries or by their trading partners. Uh, and uh, these liberalizations were then studying using either household data, uh, data on um, workers or, or firms that span these periods of trade liberalization. And I think the first thing that I want to mention there is that most of the studies that we actually have in international trade literature in developing countries actually rely on the data that is actually not best suited to study the process of structural transformation, because for most part, we just focus on manufacturing. And even within manufacturing, we focus solely on firms and workers in registered manufacturing or, you know, sometimes even on just like medium and large publicly uh, traded firms. And just to give you you know, if we think about like a few countries that have been studied quite a bit, if we just focus on this subset of firms and workers in a country like Brazil, we are only covering 70% of manufacturing workers. Uh, in uh, India, 20% of manufacturing workers or even less, for example, with Prava's data. And in a country like Vietnam, uh, 
we cover 40% of 40% uh, of workers. So I think the number one thing that we as researchers need to be doing more is broadening the uh, the types of data we are using to study uh, this question. You know, th these the existing data that people have used are really useful for other sorts of questions, but not necessarily for structural transformation. Uh, because we can't observe with this data how workers are moving across kind of low productivity to high productivity uh, sectors. Uh, the second uh, point that I want to make that uh, is related to that is uh, because informal sector is such a large share of uh, employment in developing countries or agriculture is such a large share of employment in, agri uh, in developing countries and both of these are associated with low productivity, uh, understanding how trade can contribute to economic development uh, is should really be very much focusing on these two channels. So how can trade reallocate people from informal to formal sector or from agriculture to more productive, uh, more productive uh, activities? You know, there are some recent studies that have looked at this work. For example, there's a nice recent study by um, uh, uh, Bill Geerten and Jessica Light uh, that has examined uh, the effects of China's entry into WTO and associated decline in uh, uncertainty about trade policy in the uh, United States on allocation of labor across agriculture, manufacturing and services and investments in these activities. I think that's like a really nice uh, example of a uh, study that actually provides uh, uh, empirical evidence on something many of us believed happened in China, but we really did not have uh, did not have that much evidence on. Uh, you know, Brian and I have done work examining how export opportunities have looked, uh, have moved workers from informal to formal sector in uh, Vietnam. Uh, and likewise, uh, recent work by Dix Carnero and Kovac in Brazil has also uh, examined the effects of import competition on reallocation of workers, not just within formal manufacturing center, uh, formal manufacturing sector, but also uh, from informal to uh, to formal. So I think, uh, uh, but that said, you know, there are a lot of open questions here and, uh, and I think lots of more to be done. Great, thanks. Uh, thanks, Nina, um, for, for sharing your views. Uh, so I think we'll do a round of all the panelists and then, you know, we'll, um, we'll go for, for questions. Uh, Eric, do you want to continue? Sure, sure, sure. Thanks. Um, yeah, so in my, my short uh, five minutes now, so I want to so second uh, what Nina was saying about it's exciting that the steg is happening and that uh, I've, I've been very stimulated these last couple of days. I want to use my five minutes to come back to something that was ex actually in Jacopo and Paola's paper and John's paper this morning about the distinction between sort of static and dynamic gains, which I, I feel like sometimes is lost. Right? So, so it's an old idea that basically we'd be willing to tolerate some static distortions in order to get the, the, get the rate of innovation or the rate of, rate of growth up. And sometimes a lot of discussion we had about misallocation, I feel like that's lost. But sometimes people think, well, we just allocated things correctly, you know, then, then uh, we, you know, growth would take off. But that's, that would give us static gains. It wouldn't give us necessarily dynamic gains. And so this is something actually also in Michael Peters' job market paper I was thinking about that, right, which I see is, is now forthcoming in the Econometrica. Basically had this idea, too, that markups may be necessary in order to, in order to incentivize the investments in, in innovation. And so I think that's a quite... Um, important idea that I think that uh, needs to be or could be a focus. I'm actually, if it's okay with you, Paul, I'm going to show slides. Actually, I just have three three graphics. Uh, let's see if I can do this. Uh, okay. Uh, can you can you see that? Let me, let me try and. Yes, it looks good. It looks good. Okay, good. Um, yeah. So this is a somewhat dated example, but I think it's a good one. <laughs> and I think it's re relevant. So this is uh, something, um, an example I had at a paper, a talk I gave back in 2013. So what this is, this is in manufacturing, so it's in Mexico. Uh, and this is along the x-axis here is, this is just the law of capital labor, labor ratio from the economic censuses. And, uh, and then it's uh, change the law of employment from 88 to 98. And this is just saying, this is a period over which Mexico was integrating, trade was increasing quickly. It was going from a very close to quite open economy. And you can see, as we'd expect, that um, employment rose in the, in, the least, in the less capital intensive sectors. And if you did this with skill intensity, it, it would look similar. So this is basically just what we'd expect from the simplest sort of hectorally model. Um, but the thing I think is less commonly appreciated is that if you took, um, if you just plot, again, the x-axis is the same log cap capital labor ratio, and then the y-axis is the share of plants performing 
R&D very broadly defined. This is basically like any, any spending on coming up with a new product or coming up with a new process or uh, you know, using a new technology, et cetera. So they're quite uh, from, a, from a sort of an innovation survey similar to the FinTech in, in Brazil. And there you can see that, you know, that those less capital intensive sectors are less innovation intensive, right? It's a similar point that was trying to be made um, uh, this morning. And so, and so essentially this, you know, the specialization and comparative advantage, again, it's a, very, it's a very old idea of Mexico in the static comparative advantage, arguably reduce the rate of innovation. And then, you know, what happened subsequently, and the CRI have just 98 to 2008, but, but Mexican growth has, has uh, been disappointing basically over a long period of time, um, is that there was subsequently stagnation. Now, there, there were a lot of things going on, China at the same time, but I think there's an argument to be made um, that Mexico, by pursuing its static comparative advantage, actually reduced its rate of innovation. And so one of the questions that Paula and, and Cosas had circulated before, before this talk was, you know, why haven't, uh, why hasn't Latin America and Africa industrialized, or what's what's getting in the way? Um, and I think I think that's part of it. There's just not enough innovation. And so the 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 um, I think as far as the research agenda for this group going forward, one of the things I would encourage you, uh, the group to take on is this question about you know why what's getting in the way? Why there there are the advantages of backwardness that that um, uh, Richard would, had mentioned earlier. At least there should you know these technologies should be out there and it should be available for firms to to adopt. Um, and, and what's getting in the way. And so I, I encourage you, if you, I, I'm working on a, a piece for the uh, JEL, uh, which is posted now, early draft is posted. I'd be very interested in feedback on that. Um, and, uh, but I, to me, that's, that's, a, that's sort of a first order question is, you know, there's these technologies, there's products out there that have been developed, what's, what's getting in the way. Um, I think uh, I can't, you know, I don't wanna go on, go on, go on too long um, uh, here. I could, talk, I could talk at some length about it. Um, I think, um, so, as far as the openness, you know, exposure to rich country consumers seems to matter a lot. Partly, it gets spur of pressure to, to, to upgrade. Um, of accessibility of, of high quality imported inputs uh, also also seems to matter a lot. Um, we hear a lot about one of the points I was making in this review is we hear a lot about sort of bad management uh, being an explanation. But I, I always sort of want to probe that a little bit more. Bad management could mean many things. One, it could mean that like highly skilled managers are scarce and expensive. Uh, and so you, it's hard to hire good managers. It could be that owners are making mistakes. That's the sort of the, the one, one explanation. It could be that they lack knowledge that's expensive to acquire. That's the one that seems more, uh, more likely to me. Or it could be that, in fact, everybody's optimizing. It's just organizations are complicated objects and, and it's organizations fail, even though everyone within them is, is optimizing because of information asymmetries and contracting difficulties, et cetera. Anyway, so that, those sorts of issues, I think, are the thing that, that I, would, uh, I would try to push, push the group to, to focus on. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. Um, okay, great. Thank you, Eric. Um, uh, Fabrizio, do you uh, want to take the floor? Yes. 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 Thank you very much for giving me the opportunity of speaking uh, uh, to this group. Um, you know, I come from a, a tradition in the uh, macro growth literature where we used to think as uh, country being the unit uh, of, uh, of account. Uh, and then, you know, the, we had like two, two reasons to say to do that. The first was data were most available uh, at, the, at the national level, uh, but now there are plentiful data uh, that are much more uh, granular. Uh, and the second reason was that that's what defined uh, the level of political institutions, uh, which is itself also a weak argument, because we know that the, in many cases, especially when we think of development, formal and informal institutions that are local in nature are uh, very different uh, uh, and uh, more important than uh, national governments. So, you know, it, it's great that this uh, special uh, uh, trade literature have moved uh, uh, us in a different direction. Uh, the problem is that once we abandon the safety of country borders, we are faced with new questions. So things that were obvious when we were uh, modeling uh, the world uh, uh, as a set of countries now become less obvious. Uh, in particular, uh, we have to think hard about what the natural uh, market border is. So we have uh, uh, different markets. Where do these markets clear? 
So at some level, in a more uh, globalized economy, we tend to think that it should be uh, you know, more like the world economy, where some, some uh, good uh, trade equilibrium uh, should be accounted for. And yet there are many goods and especially services that are supplied and consumed locally. And they represent really a very large part of the uh, uh, GDP of the country, of the employment of people. Think of health, sanitation, but also when you think about credit institution, having a local branch uh, uh, of a bank in the village is very important. To have a local pickup facility of, for Alibaba in China is important. These are all the type of things that the development uh, 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 specialists have been working on, but you know, uh, many times missing the general equilibrium aspect. So I want to talk about the, uh, in these uh, remarks about the interplay between uh, sectoral transformation, especially uh, economics, in particular uh, uh, with, uh, with respect to the observation that uh, uh, the service sector is becoming more and more important, not only in mature economies, but also in developing countries. You know, the classical views that is sometimes reflect in the way we do still our studies, also for data reason, is that uh, success or failure is synonym of industrialization or lack of industrialization. Uh, and, you know, this uh, generate uh, uh, improvement in division of labor, exploitation of economies of scale, and agglomeration of production uh, tend to make a, a circulation of ideas faster and it generates innovation and productivity growth. So this is a story that broadly speaking fits well the experience uh, you know, of Europe, the UK, the continental Europe, the US, but also many uh, Asian countries that uh, industrialize and develop more recently like South Korea, China, and Vietnam. But as it was mentioned already uh, during this conference, in the last, uh, uh, in, in recent period, we have witnessed the emergence of new growth patterns where we have that productivity and living standards progress in many countries without being accompanied by significant uh, shift of uh, labor and capital towards industrial sector. So rather, we, what we observe in uh, uh, many low income and low middle income economies is that the decline of agriculture is matched by a, a fast process of tertiarization, something we used to think comes later, actually. So one of the open questions here is whether this is a uh, a problem, sometimes it's perceived as a problem because, uh, well, it's not sustainable. There is an in intrinsic view that, uh, uh, you know, in the, the service sector is unable to produce uh, technical change. Or another view more optimistic is that service sector can serve itself as an engine of technical change. And I guess this is largely an empirical question. Uh, and yet uh, there are challenges in answering this. The, the, the first, the main challenge here is measurement. Uh, uh, contrary to manufacturing, it's uh, often complicated uh, to measure productivity in services. So it's complicated to construct credible price indexes that account for quality change. Think of the public bureaucracy, for instance. Uh, you know, if uh, if there is a salary increase and we measure the, the value added by by the, the uh, wages that are paid. Uh, then we don't know if that means that uh, they are paid because they produce better services or just because because they they uh, the, 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 there is some some uh, other reason behind. So we see, uh, in fact, large wage dispersion across time and spaces in the service sector, but this could be largely a general equilibrium effect. So think about you know you go to hairdresser in Switzerland, you go to hairdresser in India. In Switzerland, is much more expensive, but this reflects largely that. The fact that there are productivity differences in other sectors, we don't believe that uh, that particular service has a huge uh, difference in terms of, of productivity. But so here is where I think, uh, and you know, the work uh, uh, I'm doing with uh, 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 Tianyu Fan and uh, Michael Peters uh, moves in that direction. That uh, economic geography and spatial equilibrium theory can, can can help. So let me give you an idea of how we are thinking about this. Uh, so, first of all, we have at our disposal a geolocalized microdata uh, and it tells us where people work, the sector of activity, uh, how much they earn, their consumption pattern, their education. And, and then we can uh, um, now, now let's think of classifying sectors in a different way from the one we were accustomed. So, let's try to think of the extent of their local tradability or the tradability of across space being a way in which we, we group uh, uh, activities. So we may want to put together some services 
like uh, restaurants, retail, personal services that are uh, intrinsically locally with construction activities, for instance, that con where construction activities are, uh, at least for what concerns the residential uh, construction, largely uh, uh, local. So, so this, uh, uh, so the, then, then uh, you know, in the in the when we model this, uh, we think that some markets clear locally, then there are some markets can clear national, and some market may even be international. So you can incorporate as we do uh, international trade in order in order of this type. Another important aspect that we have in the literature on structural change that we want to bring in is uh, the strength of income effect because we think that this is important. And you know the way we uh, actually do is similar to uh, the way Michael uh, uh, described in, in his own presentation. So we use uh, this type of Pigot class of preferences, but other people may have different preferences. That uh, you know there are pros and cons in using different type of uh, preferences. So the, what we are eventually try to do is to estimate the strength of the income effect from these preferences, use it as a discipline in the model, and then combine this with uh, the assumption that uh, certain market clear locally, uh, in particular in our study we think about at, at the Indian district uh, level. And so, uh, you know, this gives us the, the possibility of uh, uh, writing a model where we can solve for the set of productivity and preference parameters jointly in a, uh, through an inversion approach a la Allen Arcolatis. Um, and again, you know, it's, it's the joint consideration of the income effect that are disciplined by uh, the, what uh, the data tell us, uh, give it some structure of preferences and some assumption about, about credibility. So, you know, this, if we observe this uh, type of uh, um, uh, distributions at different point of time, we can engage in some type of new way of doing develop, what we call development accounting. So development accounting uh, has been used for years now, and it's a simple way of making uh, uh, comparable uh, productivities uh, across uh, across countries, but it typically uses uh, simply uh, aggregate production functions. So here we would like to estimate productivity at the local level across sector and across space, and uh, at this uh, uh, set of uh, uh, restrictions that are given by a general equilibrium model will allow us to identify this. So and then once one has this type of model, and you know uh, this may be a specific application, but I think it can be generalize, one can do the type of things these models are very good at, like run counterfactual analysis and ask questions like, uh, you know, how important was for structural transformation technical change in different sector? And if we can start measuring the welfare effects, so uh, especially that, that's why we mainly use this type of PIGL preferences, uh, because they allow some type of quasi-aggregation. Let me not expand on that, but it is possible there to make statement a different uh, ladder of the income distribution. So, you know, for instance, it could be that uh, productivity growth in agriculture has important welfare effect on some group of people, but not some other, and that can reflect both income and where different, uh, different people live. Uh, so why is this uh, whole thing uh, uh, policy relevant? Well, because, you know, this productivity distribution and the development uh, of uh, uh, different areas rather than others has the uh, uh, excellent talk that Claire gave, uh, uh, pointed out today, uh, re reflect also to some extent some policy choice, uh, industrial policy, place-based policy, and so on. So I don't want to uh, give any uh, uh, of the results we have, but I thought that uh, this was a, a way of uh, introducing this topic of you know how to bring structural transformation into a model where we have a special equilibrium element. I think Michael is around, so he might even step in and say something more later. Uh, thanks a lot, uh, Fabrizio, uh, for, for sharing your, uh, your, your new work and, and your thoughts on that. Um, Robin, do you want to uh, sure. talk now? Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you uh, for inviting me. Um, uh, yeah, I'm as somebody else said, I'm a huge fan of this sort of area of work, structural change and so forth. So what I did in preparing for this which is, was to kind of set myself a question. So I'm not sure I'm going to answer, but I thought it would, would help me uh, um, react to the, the set of questions that Costas and Paula sent. 
Um, and the question is kind of why is Africa not industrialized, which is of course the question that comes up most in this, uh, at least in the developing country literature. And I think the, the way I sort of thought about it was to think through the lens of stuff. I mean, I'm really a development economist rather than a trade economist uh, of kind of the stuff I know about. So the, the stuff I know about is I recently with Oriana Bandier at the LSC been putting together labor market surveys for about, I think about 60 different developing countries to sort of figure out you know, who's doing what work where and so forth. And then I've done a bunch of randomized controlled trials on firms, households to do with agricultural extension, training, apprenticeship, asset transfer, and so forth. And going back to uh, what was said before, the, the advantage of getting into this type of data is I think it, at least for me, it, it brings the focus back more to change in employment. So as being the main focus in uh, that the perhaps structural change we should be uh, looking at. I mean, the point has already been made that much of the trade liberalization which has looked at manufacturing. Fabrizio has pointed the fact that actually when people leave agriculture, they don't, they're not going into, uh, into manufacturing so much for services. So I think what's interesting about a jobs focus is it kind of brings together an interest from the development economists, which is sort of poverty and that kind of stuff. And then an interest from the more macro literature and productivity and growth. And I think what I'm going to do you know, in the remainder of my remarks is just to say a few things about you know, what, what we might learn from taking on that more jobs, uh, uh, jobs focus within, within structural change. So another factor, a sort of background fact, which I think is definitely worth keeping in mind is that if you look at population growth, um, that is happening predominantly in the developing world and predominantly in Africa and South Asia. And so a lot of the path of development uh, will be determined by whether kind of youngish workers are matched to good jobs or better jobs than they're currently being matched to. And as Fabrizio has already mentioned, that requires us to think about how people might leave agriculture and go into things like uh, services. There's also something which um, Claire pointed to earlier in the session, which I think is worth mentioning, which is there is now growing evidence that rural areas and particularly people engaged in subsistence agriculture in rural areas are gonna be more exposed uh, to environmental stresses. So there's gonna be that, that factor coming into the, um, into the analysis. So I think the first thing I wanted to say is simply that for my own work, it's important not to be too ambitious. So often, you know, often people lament the, the lack of industry in Africa, but actually what you see when you look at spatially at where the jobs are, you see basically very kind of unproductive jobs being in the more remote rural areas, and then a kind of gradation towards more productive, if not highly productive, but certainly more productive jobs as one starts to approach uh, cities. So going back to some of the things that uh, Michael was talking about earlier, there is this sort of question about what is the right size of economy to think about. So in some of the work, for example, I've done in Bangladesh, even the movement within a village of people from say doing casual labor to doing livestock is has a huge welfare impact and that is partly because people move into actually being able to trade products like milk and so forth similarly in some of the work we've done in uganda there was a, a huge value in people moving from agriculture into informal services and manufacturing so i guess what i'm saying is this kind of what you might call low level structural change can have big effects on on poverty and welfare and that's that should be kind of kept in mind that we don't have to go all the way from working in subsistence agriculture to work in an industrial park or something like that, which is often how people uh, at least uh, uh, see, see the ideal. Um, I guess the second thing I wanna say is that there is an awful lot of bad jobs out there. When you begin to look at all these jobs across all these countries, it is actually stunning how 
unproductive workers are in many, many different parts of the world. And that in Asia is often to do with casual labor in Africa, not to do with smallholders. So there's a big question about how you get people out of these, uh, these bad jobs. And I think, you know, going back to the topic of this uh, session, I think infrastructure and openness is critical to doing that. Now there's some proper evaluations of those things, but even just the spatial pattern suggests that getting greater connection both to the world economy, but even to the domestic economy uh, has big effects. Another, another sort of fact and uh, an issue which I'm not gonna say much about is there is this enormous question about why they're not bigger firms in Africa. There's lots of smaller firms, but there's no big firm, well, there's, there's not many big firms. And I, I guess that's a question which obviously Steg will be thinking about and it's kind of partly an organizational question, but also one about uh, trade and openness. So what I wanted to do is, is just say a few things about um, the, the problem as I see it. So the, the problem I see it is when you look at say all these labor surveys across many countries, what you see is a concentration of people in what I would describe as almost medieval jobs. So these are people who are basically semi-autarkic. They're producing, say, maize and cassava, and they're eating the maize and cassava, and they're doing... So they're not trading very much, and they're hugely unproductive. There's a real question in my mind whether or not you can do in situ policies which would, engage, which would allow them to move into... Uh, more productive types of jobs within those rural areas, or whether many of them would have to move uh, into cities. So I think one, one big area that Steg could think about, I know that Doug has done a lot of work in this area, is thinking about those sort of stepping stones. So for example, could you move to creating more commercial agriculture? Because at least with the commercial agriculture, you're beginning to trade uh, a, a higher, higher valued good. And you know, that may help people to at least move to a higher level of uh, productivity. There is also, as I already said, this big question about how dropping trade costs and improving the information environment can help people to move out of these sort of medieval uh, jobs. So these, you know, these are things like investments in transportation and energy and communication infrastructures, which again point to what the role of uh, specialization and increasing market size would be. So linked to this, kind of bad jobs or medieval jobs in rural areas is the big question about how one makes the uh, um, cities more attractive to, 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 to uh, absorb these workers. And I think there's a, there's a, there's has been now a growing amount of work about how one might think about encouraging migration into cities rather than discouraging it. And again, many of these policies to do with infrastructure, openness, uh, are relevant. So if you take, you know, for example, the peri-urban areas of Uganda or the peri-urban areas of Bangladesh, what you basically see is that as the infrastructure improves, as you move into these peri-urban areas, then you get begin to see people moving out of agriculture and into these sort of uh, service sector uh, type jobs, which even though they're not highly productive, are, are mean that, they're, that, that these people are um, uh, producing uh, you know, more stuff, more value. So I think what, in terms of the, 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 um, uh, the, the challenge, I guess, to Steg is, how are you gonna join the micro with the macro? So one big part of that, I think, will be studying employment change uh, across uh, space, because I think that's a golden opportunity to bring those two groups of uh, economists together. And for that, you're going to need geolocated uh, data on people and firms uh, in order to, and, and also means of tracking the movements of people and goods. And there's been a lot of use of cell phone data, many different types of sensing data. And I think that's going to be a big part of no longer leaving the structural change problem in the sort of macro uh, domain. I think fundamentally, there has to be some sense of what types or, or some exploration of what types of employment uh, can take root uh, uh, and, and where. And clearly uh, things like the infrastructure and trade environment are uh, important. But I wanted to just finish with, with just, I guess, two points. Um, one is that in what I've seen, um, there is a big role for thinking about policies 
which are large enough transfers of capital and human capital, which actually enable people to change the jobs they're doing. And I think that is important, even if, whether people stay where they are or move, but thinking about what policies typically done by governments or very large NGOs can actually encourage that process is one kind of class of intervention that state could be thinking about. And the other one, which is more obvious is whether the building and infrastructure of different types and different types of trade policies actually encourage this low level structural change that I'm talking about. So I guess I would sort of shy away from the traditional focuses of a lot of the structural change work, which is on the kind of encouragement of industrialization, and begin to get much more granular data on the work that people's doing and how different uh, types of interventions affect uh, the, the composition of that work and hence people's uh, productivity. So I think I'll, I'll stop there. Thanks. Um... Thanks a lot, uh, Robin. Yeah, so one question I have, uh, you know, uh, on these, uh, I think it's an interesting idea, no, that, um, you know, we see this movement, you know, straight from agriculture to our services and whether or not we should be uh, worrying about that. Um, I guess uh, one of the, of the worries uh, uh, about, about that is that, um, this uh, service sector is uh, non-traded. Uh, so to some extent, uh, this, you know, having very few people uh, in agriculture and, and many people in services, in a sense, implies that, um, you know, the imports of manufacturing goods have, be, have to be done with the income from agriculture. And if this income is very much a, concentrated, it can generate, uh, you know, a situation where traded goods are very expensive, right? If these agricultural goods are exported and, the, you know, the owners of these gains uh, are, are very concentrated. So uh, do, do you think this is an issue in practice? And this is one of the reasons why we think that moving to manufacturing where income from traded goods is more, uh, you know, widely distributed uh, in the population uh, can, you know, make it easier uh, to get this transition uh, to, to higher, you know, levels of per capita income. One of the panelists. Can, can I, do you want me to say something or you want to collect more questions? Yeah, no, I'm just, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm wondering, you yeah. know, uh, why, I, I'm trying to think, why do we care about industrialization, right? Um, mm -hmm. You know, maybe this is, you know, one of the reasons that, that, that we do care about that and, and we think that going straight from agriculture to services might might be a problem i'd like to say two things on this first I, you know having said that uh, you know it makes sense to think of most services being uh, uh, non-traded there is also this is a very heterogeneous group and you know if you think of india for instance there is mm -hmm. a significant extent of exports of services you know mm -hmm. service activities are an important share of uh, of the of the total export so I have the feeling that you know the world overall has uh, become incredibly productive at uh, at the, the manufacturing goods, which make them incidentally also cheaper to import. To, which is another piece of the answer to your question that comes to mind. That you know, it we may be worried about something that is perhaps the result of this uh, production in uh, manufacturing having become so productive that necessarily we have very few human bodies there. And, you know, that could, could be, you know, uh, part of the ex exports uh, uh, is going to take place in service and probably that will grow over, over time. And importing uh, manufacturing good may, may be not so expensive. Thanks. All right. Can I say something? So I was, I was kind of um, was fascinated because like all the, in a sense, all the, speeches had the common theme of like, you know, what are the frictions that would allow people to move from one sector to another sector? And I guess we didn't really talk about the big picture. Are these frictions like um, mobility frictions of moving across sectors or it could be like infrastructure, lack of infrastructure, or other type of training? And, you know, what, what do you think, especially perhaps for Africa? recently gone 
you know, why someone would like to discuss about that, and of course, how research could help uh, kind of understand these forces. I think there's a kind of a huge mass of people who are so unskilled that uh, they're not really suitable for a whole range of more productive jobs. And that, that obviously is a, you know, so if you look at say Africa, the rural parts of Africa, there's very few non-agricultural jobs. And so very maybe limited incentives to acquire uh, human capital and so forth. So then you have this mass of people who either are uninformed about the job opportunities or simply unqualified. So then you have to, you know, either inform them or uh, qualify them in order for them to, to be able to move to something more meaningful. But then I think there is this, this other factor, which is difficult to pin down, where traditionally the cities wanted to dissuade people from moving into their, into their borders because they were moving into slums and so forth. And so the, the urban policies were often anti-immigration. So again, that, that was a factor in constraining people from uh, moving into those areas. So I think that, that there's both a sort of what is the environment in the city and how welcoming is it to migrants, as well as whether the migrants themselves can uh, find meaningful work um, in the cities. And I think that, that matching is kind of what I'm pointing at as being really critical to what happens to development in these very, very low income places where they're really stuck in in jobs that kind of their parents and grandparents have been doing. No, that's very interesting. I think it's related to what um, Eric and Nina said, because in a sense, if you, you know, like going to the formal sector is, you know, your best chance in that case, getting a service job that is informal or working to kind of a, you know, a sector that is kind of salary, you know, not very productive, for getting it done. So you don't know much what else to do. Maybe that's the, I don't know if Eric or Nina want to comment something on that. Yeah, I mean, I would agree. I would, Robin, that the skill uh, mismatch is a potentially like a really big part of the issue. In part, I think one of the reasons why in Vietnam this transition went fairly smoothly is because of their communist past. People were actually fairly well educated for the level of development uh, of the country. And uh, that's why once uh, it was easier to move uh, across sectors, in addition to kind of geographically, it's a country one can uh, more easily uh, move. Uh, but more generally, oftentimes, you know, uh, you know as um, uh, 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 Eric pointed out, there might be some firms that are actually innovating quite a bit or taking advantage of uh, uh, imported inputs and are kind of the technological frontier. But how many, uh, you know, can these firm, how many workers can these firms absorb and like what are the general equilibrium effects of these uh, of this innovation and even if they can't like are there uh, you know uh, are workers uh, do they have um, a sufficient level of skill to work uh, at, at these uh, plants uh, I think I mean there might be also other barriers that might be more uh, 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 you know um, location specific for example in, in India and probably you know, in, in other settings there are going to be different issues like when you're lacking uh, informal uh, formal insurance or uh, kind of uh, social safety net people are going to be relying much more on family or institutions such as CAST for provision of uh, social safety and, and informal insurance and that might be uh, deterring uh, deterring movements uh, uh, you know even like even in a, in a country like United States uh, kind of housing costs have been uh, pr uh, providing uh, barriers to uh, moving uh, low skill uh, individuals so I, I think I mean I think these are you know good kind of open questions uh, uh, to to study and I think oftentimes we will be getting kind of fairly uh, location specific answers uh, to them as uh, you know some of the participants in yesterday's um, yesterday's panel uh, uh, pointed out. I think Lori Beeman was saying that kind of the market frictions that, they, uh, that uh, her and Chris Udry expected in, I think it was Mali, were not the ones that they ended up observing uh, when they were doing a pilot for their, uh, for their um, uh, experiment. Uh, yeah, I mean, maybe, yeah, just kind of to close the panel then can open it to questions to the panel. Maybe Eric wants to, I mean, like it seems like this, Related to your point, there's some barriers to innovating, either kind of to your own, like building your own human capital, or innovating, like 
in your own term, that's high added value and so on. And people ending up doing jobs that are not high value added. Yeah, talk about yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, so I guess two thoughts. So one thought in response to Paolo's question about what's the problem of going to agricultural services. I mean, the traditional answer, which I, I think is not incorrect, is you know, it, where's the innovation happening, right? And the worry is always that services, there's not a lot of innovation happening in services. And as people get, the world gets richer, they're gonna, you know, they might buy less of whatever that, that sector is bruising. Now that's too simple a story, right? So obviously what Fabrizio's point is important, that services are very heterogeneous, all these sectors are very heterogeneous. But, so we wanna be focusing on the innovative activities. And then the question about like allocation of people across space or sectors, I guess I, my general view is this is not, this is sort of a, a gut feeling, I guess, about this is that, is that um, you know, th those movements tend to be pulled by dynamic industries or dynamic activities, whatever those are. Some industries are gonna, are gonna you know, start developing, they start growing, they're gonna start demanding people, people will acquire those skills. And, and, and that's the way the process happens. More than that, people invest a lot in skills and, then, and the, that somehow that, that generates you know that somehow you know a, an industry arises because of that. Maybe Indian software is a is a is a is a counterexample, but but generally I sort of feel like that's the way it goes. And so policymakers should focus on the getting the getting your your sectors growing and innovating, and then the other stuff will sort of work itself out. Yeah, there's definitely less focus on that rather than kind of mobility of labor and big restrictions. People have to this, may I, measure. <coughs> may I add one thing? that is uh, in connection with, or you prefer to get more questions, sorry. Uh, maybe briefly and then we can get more questions, yeah. You get more questions, okay. No, no, briefly add that and then- Yeah, so I wanted to add one point, you know, uh, to this discussion, uh, both, you know, somehow to agree with what Robin said before uh, and also related to what uh, um, Eric and Nina have been saying. I, you know, many times we think the potential of growth is in innovation and, you know, I've been working on that and, but, somehow especially when an economy is very poor just improvement in the division of labor may be as important or even more important and i think that one way we can think of the process of growth of services and you know decline of agriculture is you know a number of activity becoming marketized so a lot of stuff that were done at home uh, all of a sudden are produced you know some more people go to restaurants and again on the one hand, that may, may be the result of an income effect, but it can also uh, result in a more in, in higher productivity. Now, how far that can go, perhaps not all the way to, uh, to, to what the Western economies are today, but it, it has proven, uh, uh, you know, at least, you know, as long as you keep some uh, uh, peaceful condition and, you know, for, for minimal improvement and for, for people to trade, it, I think this has been an important force in the in the process of uh, growth of, of very poor countries. Now, it's true, on the other hand, that this uh, marketization might mean that uh, we overestimate growth to some extent. Maybe uh, stuff that were done at home were not counted as part of the GDP, and now we start counting them. But you know, if you think about the work of Alvin Young, for instance, it looks as if people can really afford more stuff over the years. Uh, you know, even if we don't see a big, great deal of industrialization, I think that. Uh, it's very encouraging to see economies that grow at over 5% uh, per year and people uh, buy uh, more, uh, uh, you know, uh, household goods, uh, they buy motorcycles, they buy stuff like that. So uh, there is a sense in which uh, this has produced improvement in, in the standard of living. And again, I think that this dimension of marketization and uh, division of labor, even without big episodes of innovation, may be important. Great. Um... Okay, thanks everyone. That was like a great round of uh, insightful points. Maybe you can take a few questions and then one at a time can say their, their view. Uh, uh, I have a question from Margaret McMillan, actually multiple points, but maybe you can consolidate them in one, Margaret. And then Margaret is still. Uh, maybe she stepped out. How about uh, Michael? You had a question. You can raise your hand. Do you want to, Michael Peters? Hello. Uh, oh. Oh, Margaret is here. Okay, sorry. Please. Yeah. So, let Margaret is here. So, please. I, I I just want to make two points. First off, is um, the idea that there's a jump from agriculture to services is it, it, not true, at least in the African case. In the two countries that I've been studying most carefully, Ethiopia and Tanzania, you've had a big share, uh, also a big increase in the share of employment in informal sector manufacturing. Whether you want to call that manufacturing or not is a different story. Then I also think that 
this group needs to think a lot more carefully about uh, the distinctions between, for example, countries in Latin America and countries in Africa. You know, a country like Brazil has 9% of the labor force in agriculture already went through significant structural changes. Whereas a country like Ethiopia, I mean, I mean in, until the recent past, it had 90% of the labor force in agriculture and, and industrialization never really took off. So to, to lump them together, I think is misleading. Mm-hmm. Sorry, I'm old and ornery. <laughs> Been working on this stuff for too long, but. Yeah, that's um, okay. I know someone, Lina, do you want to take a turn? Let's talk about it. Let's... Yeah, I mean, I, I would agree with uh, Maggie that uh, you know I think we do have to pay attention to the uh, to the local uh, context, uh, and that there are you know we oftentimes can ignore differences across uh, countries. Uh, the other thing that I wanted to uh, mention is uh, that oftentimes this structural you know reallocation, and I think uh, uh, Michael Peters makes a very good point: is like how do we differentiate between structural transformation versus just structural allocation? Uh, it, I think it also has like a, a, g- a generational component. So, uh, you know, for example, like in Vietnam, it's really the young who are uh, doing this uh, reallocation process. It's not really the older. Uh, and so maybe kind of thinking about kind of intergenerational differences uh, also is important uh, in, this, uh, in this context. Yeah, that's a good point. Maybe also in part uh, responding to uh, kind of the question that uh, Michael posed. Yeah. Uh... Michael Peters, you had a question. You were trying to raise your hand. Are you still here? Yeah, but, I mean, this is, and Nina already addressed it somewhat, but this is sort of just like a, a pretty open question, which I would be curious if anybody in this room has something to think about, because I am somehow struggling to distinguish between sector reallocation and structural transformation. To be very concrete, if we think about the China shock and we see I don't know, we, we can associate an, a reduction in manufacturing employment in the US because of import competition. Would we consider that structural transformation or would we just consider that import competition and declining manufacturing response? Or, you know, I was just curious to, see, to, to, to hear if anybody has sort of a, a, a clear notion of, of whether we should think about a, a structural transformation as sort of a bigger aspect of sector relocation together with other qualitative changes in, in, in the life these people go through. Is the question about, this is Joe, sorry. Is it, it's also somewhat about sort of like the time frequency that we're thinking about? Is it a long-term trend? Is that what you're saying or a medium term? Or is that part of what you're asking or no? I, I, think, that, I think that's a part of it. But I, you know, if I had a cleaner definition, I, 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 I would be happier and wouldn't have asked the question. <laughs> So no, since you're here, again, you are trying to raise your hand. And do you want to ask your question too? And then we can put both questions at the time. Joe Kaboski. Oh, uh, no, sorry. Uh, I, I can, uh, um, I, I, I mean, I was thinking when Doug and I were sort of thinking about research strategies, we definitely had a bigger picture vision of what structural transformation entailed, certainly beyond just industrialization and moving out of agriculture. And even beyond, even though I I like services, even beyond thinking about services. So I I appreciated all the comments, the entire panel, thinking about formal versus informal. That's not something that has like a real, um, a clear place in the themes, but it's something we thought about in terms of thinking about the employment and the cities. I think those are also, you know, very important um, things of thinking about how economies transform. I guess my question originally was for Rob and was thinking about the city. I also had this idea that the, the big stuff happens and then the little things will kind of take care. You know, there's a, an allocation of people to jobs and once jobs are available, people will come in and fill them. Um, but your point, Robin, about the making the cities attractive, I thought was interesting. And I, I don't really know this literature very well. One question I had is sort of like what some of these things are clearly government government role, uh, infrastructure. I wonder whether crime is another uh, issue, which is obviously another gr- government role. But then things like housing, I know that there's uh, research on housing, and it's not clear whether they, that's something the government should be doing or that's something that the private sector is doing inefficiently because of other frictions. And I guess I was just curious what we know about this. 
Um, Robin, there were a lot of questions, but maybe you can uh, take your spin on some of them. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, I, 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 there is stuff on both on sort of the, the government building housing, or uh, but I think there's a there's a there's a a kind of a tension, I suppose, between what you were describing as sort of uh, encouraging firms to set up, and then that will lead workers to try, you know, get training and so forth, uh, which is kind of more of the, you know, the kind of macro uh, view of things. And then from the more micro side, there's a view that, well, if you didn't provide training to people in some form, then they're not, they're not going to move and so forth. So you have a kind of a little bit of a tension between the kind of micro intervention approach and then the, you know, let us build and they will come uh, sort of approach. And I guess I find it, going back to what uh, Margaret was saying, a lot of what's happening is this kind of low level informal manufacturing service stuff, which is not very distinct. These jobs are not very distinct from one another, but understanding what, what are the factors that allow those jobs to appear at greater frequency, I think is still a pretty much an open question. Um, and there are, there are very distinct urban policies, some of which have been evaluated and some which have not. So one, one concrete example is whether you view slums as a negative in a city or not, because on one hand, they're great because they enable people to move into cities that couldn't. On the other hand, they might create crime and poor sanitation and other factors. So you're kind of balancing those two things. And those are, you know, claims are 40% of people in these cities are living in these slums. So kind of what you do on that front probably has some bearing on the number of workers that actually are willing to move in from the countryside. Um, so that's, so, sorry, slightly vague, but I think it's, um, it's relevant. Great. Um, Marina and Goma, do you want to um, ask your question? Uh, I think uh, that's uh, I think that's been covered by uh, Robin's comment. I was just uh, wondering um, for the question of whether we would care about manufacturing um, uh, instead of services. I was wondering about the explanation that um, uh, the manufacturing jobs might not require much skills um, as compared to. Um, advanced services sectors is uh, part of the explanations why we would care about uh, manufacturing. Is this a question to Robin or? No, I think, I think that has been discussed already. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, I think Swati um, has a question, I think. Swati, okay. Uh, Sorry, and, and Joan. Hi, Paula. So Sorry. Sorry, should I carry on? Yes, please. So I wanted to get the panel's views on um, having an urban job guarantee in developing economies. So questions came up about, or other points were brought up by Robin and everyone else, thinking about what are we going to do about young people who are coming into cities and what are we going to do that we've tried many different kinds of policies, including services exports in India, but it hasn't really sort of managed to absorb people into very productive jobs. And, one, and there's also this discussion about infrastructure development, which in some sense an urban job guarantee would be able to cater to when there's actually real discussions going on within India about this. So what are the panel's views and a lot of the work that we've done with um, workers in India during COVID and before seems to suggest that that's something that they would really value. Um, okay. I'm happy to, yeah, I'm happy to jump in. Uh, thanks, Swati, for the, for the, for the question. Or, or do you want to, uh, Kosas, you want to collect questions or, or you want? Uh, no, no, please answer the question. No, no. So I think it's very interesting. I guess, the, I mean, one question is whether it should be an, an urban jobs guarantee or just a jobs guarantee. <laughs> um, but I think it's interesting. Or at Sorry, least I should several, clarify. I meant a universal job guarantee. Universal job guarantee, yeah. yeah. Uh, but it's interesting that there's increasing work that, that uh, actually, you know, higher wages actually may actually pro provide sort of a stimulating role. 
uh, for so partly I'm thinking of the, the paper that Jacopo and, and uh, presented this morning. Uh, okay. There's a paper Clement Imbert and co-authors have a paper in you know in China where the places where you get more low skill migration end up being less innovative. Also, uh, there are a couple papers out there again in China about how minimum wage when wages in China tended to raise productivity in the firms that were that were more affected. And I think that's interesting. It's sort of pushing firms to hire higher skill workers and then to upgrade on other dimensions as well. And so, you know, there's, there's again, it's back to the static distortion versus dynamic gains. And, you know, we could probably argue about that. And it's very possible that the static distortions are, 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 are large in this case. But, but to me, I think that's something to, to, to consider. I don't, yeah. So it seems apart from the issue about, you know, urban policy, but I think even in terms of simulating growth, it may actually be, have a positive effect. Sure, I think it's still unclear how you would sort out the rural versus urban issues there, I think. We probably don't know enough. Yeah. Okay, and uh, maybe John Monras um, can kind of close because she has a question related to California. So that's something we haven't covered that. Yeah, so I mean, my, my question was, I mean, I have uh, a little bit the feeling that we know better and better how uh, micro policy interventions work. Uh, but we perhaps know a little bit less about how uh, perhaps broader policies uh, may be effective, right? And perhaps moving beyond what we did several years ago, like trade liberalization that has led to some good outcomes in some cases and some bad outcomes in some, in some other cases. Uh, what are the sets of policies that we should be thinking about uh, from education, from minimum wages, from uh, a whole set of, of policies that are discussed in the developed world that uh, may uh, encourage uh, growth and may encourage uh, uh, both uh, static or dynamic gains that, that we've been talking about. And, and which ones are politically feasible as well, right? Uh, I mean, I know it's a broad question, but, but just uh, to, to have elements to think about it. And, uh... But something that they are, they are actually doing uh, is place-based policies. Uh, we, I don't think we have an answer for uh, how effective they are. E economists tend to be uh, broadly skeptical of those. You know, this is something that clearly is influenced by China. So China has done a lot of uh, place-based policies and so Ethiopia is doing its place-based policies and uh, so we I mean, here there was, there was a question about, you know, should we make cities larger or should we build new cities? I mean, that's what literally happened in many cases in China. So think of, uh, again, it was mentioned before, Shenzhen. Uh, so at the same time, you know, is this uh, something that uh, uh, really generates large spillover? Uh, the experience of China, you know, there are mixed, uh, mixed results, you know. My own results are more optimistic than uh, those of others, and I don't want to, to say uh, uh, we're right. Um, but I think, you know, the, among the many policies on the, on, the, on, the, on, the, on the ground, this is something that is actually currently being done. So perhaps it would be interesting to have someone to make uh, an attempt to evaluate them. Special economic zones, I guess. Thank you, Rabbi. And maybe last question by Luis Filipe. We're a couple of minutes. Uh... Uh, late, but I think it's very interesting. Luis Felipe, can you hear me? Yeah, thank you. I think that that was uh, exactly what, what Fabrizio just mentioned. They, they know. I wouldn't add the the should because I'm not so sure about the policy implications yet. But I just wonder after the paper of, of Michael Peter and the presentation. So it's super interesting to see how the the structural transformation is really local. But I wonder what are your thoughts about that in developing countries where whether this lack of migration to transform is taking it should be taking place or or if it's a policy question or failure to help a urbanization um, someone wants to take a final question uh, can i I'll, I'll, can I say something can i uh I'm sorry, Luis, I don't have much to say in response to your question. Can I respond to Joanne's question, earlier question, briefly? Yeah, which is, we haven't, we, have, we, have, we haven't, <laughs> no, which is to say, so something that hasn't been talked about very much in this group, but I think, you know, the sort of state capacity or the capacity of the bureaucracy to implement policies is obviously crucial, no? So I, so I think we're all kind of thinking about, 
you know, you would think, well, it was sort of industrial, you know, what used to be called industrial policy. I don't know if we can still call it industrial policy, but uh, industrial policy. And the, the elephant in the room there is just that do you have a government that's actually competent for, for doing industrial policy? And that seems, that seems crucial. So that's something that maybe that should be integrated also into the, into the agenda of the group is, is you know, if you, if you could figure out what, you know, how policies that would bring about sexual transformation, can the governments actually implement those in a, in a competent way? Um, so that seems, yeah. I mean, I guess there's this sort of question in my mind, which you could describe as why is anybody living in South Dakota, right? Um, question, which is sort of in the Ugandan context, why is anybody living in some far-flung district of Uganda? And I think that that's, that is an interesting question, whether that's sort of inefficiency or, or just the, you know, people, there's other factors which lead people to want to remain in South Dakota or some remote part of Uganda and what, what policies, if it is an inefficiency, are going to change that because on the whole it is changing I mean, over time. Um, but thinking, thinking that through I think is really, really interesting whether there's enough there in that local economy to sustain what people want in terms of work or whether they need to move in order to kind of you know, use their ability. I think it's difficult to answer that, that question but it is, it is sort of one of the more fundamental ones. Yeah, and I think that kind of speaks to a lot of the integration between trade and sexual deformation. Yeah. Okay.